Eclipse from Erie, Pennsylvania. Was it the moon? Based on a presentation by Jeremy McGarry. A classic theme among flat earth folks is that during a solar eclipse, something other than the moon is obscuring the sun. Recently on Taboo Conspiracy's channel, he mirrored a presentation by Jeremy McGarry hosted by Hanging on His Words. Jeremy's presentation called into question that it was the moon that caused the April 8th 2024 eclipse. He used sun and moon data from the U.S. Naval Observatory to help plan his observations as well as footage from a wide-angle camera mounted to his house. He even built a model with two rods for the paths and painted wooden balls for the sun and moon. His basic premise is that since the sun and moon traced identical paths across the sky and during the eclipse the sun catches up to the moon, then the pattern should be in line with the sun-moon trajectory. So our expectation would be that the eclipse pattern should have been like this, and the physical wood and steel model shows the pattern to be similar. Yet reality showed this and this. So can we use the same U.S. Naval Observatory website to perform an analysis and figure out what's really going on? Here's the plan. We'll capture data from both the sun and the moon at 20-minute increments for the duration of the eclipse, as seen from Erie, Pennsylvania, from 2 p.m. to or 1400 to 5 p.m. or 1700. Then we'll make a scatter plot for the azimuth on the x-axis and elevation on the y-axis and then we'll adjust for first contact. And to make things interesting, we'll do it all in real time using Google Sheets. So we're gonna start off with the US Navy website and we're gonna select the sun and then we're gonna change the interval to uh, 20 minutes. 20 minute interval on the date of the eclipse. The latitude longitude is for Erie PA and then we're gonna get the data. Now we only want from 1400 to 1700, from 2 p.m. to to 5 p.m. So we're gonna get 1400, and then we're gonna just select the data. Now the two columns are elevation and azimuth. So we're gonna open up a blank spreadsheet in Google Sheets, and then paste the data. And let's label the columns. So we've got uh, sun elevation is uh, that column, and then we have um, azimuth for the next column. Now we do want azimuth to be on the x-axis, so we're going to have to uh, shift sun elevation to be to the right so that the first column is the x and the second column is the y. Now we're going to repeat the process. We just hit the back button and we're back in the uh, Navy website and we're just going to click on moon and we're just going to get uh, click get data and it gets all the same data for the moon but it adds an additional column this one uh, shows percent illumination which is zero because it's a new moon so again 1400 to 1700 we're going to copy that to the clipboard and then we're going to paste that into our spreadsheet now we don't need percent illumination so we're going to get rid of those zeros and again we're going to move the elevation column to the right but we want to give it its own series so the moon elevation is going to be its own column that will distinguish it from the sun elevation. Now here's a problem. Because of that little degree symbol, uh, the spreadsheet does not consider any of these things to be numbers. It considers them all to be text. So we're gonna do a search and replace. We're searching for the degree symbol and we're just replacing it with nothing. Now all these values are numerical. So we can actually graph them with a scatter plot. So I'm gonna select all the data and I'm gonna click insert and uh, chart. So we wanna insert a chart, but we don't want it to be a column chart. We want it to be a scatter plot. All right, and so that basically maps every dot on az azimuth and altitude. So let's clean it up a little bit. We're gonna change the background color to black, and then we're gonna change the color of the sun and moon. Let's give the sun a nice yellow color and let's give the moon uh, actually a very dark gray. This will kind of simulate the eclipse. All right, and let's uh, change the text to white 
and repeat the process with the horizontal and vertical axes. All right. Now, there is a problem. If you look in the lower left corner, uh, 0 to 20 elevation on the y-axis takes up the same space as 200 to 210. In other words, my aspect ratio is off by a factor of 2. So I'm going to have to um, change the horizontal aspect so that from 0 to 200, uh, from 0 to 20, takes up the same space as from 200 to 220. All right, so that's about right. Now, the next problem is that that first pair of sun-moon uh, circles should be first contact because first contact happened very close to, uh, to 2 p.m. So I'm just going to try to shift the size of this so that it just barely looks like it's touching. That looks about right. And we're done. All right. So again, this graph, is, it's just an approximation. I mean, it's just a scatter plot based on data, but I hope that you do get the picture about what's going on here. Now, let's, now that we know that using the actual data for the sun and moon, that it produces the same pattern as Jeremy witnessed in Erie, why does it appear like there is some circular object coming in from the lower right and exiting upper left? Well, the key is frame of reference. Here are two animations. The top one shows the eclipse as the sun catches up to the moon as they both move across the sky. But the lower one has, a, has the sun in a fixed position, just as with photographers tracking the sun with zoom cameras. So what about the physical model that Jeremy made with wood and steel? The question here is one of scale. So here's a screenshot showing two positions of the sun separated by about 30 degrees of azimuth. And now let's superimpose his physical model. Turns out that these balls were roughly 26 times bigger than reality, and their locations were not proportional to the actual sun and moon during the eclipse. So for contrast, here's an image of the eclipse from his wide-angle camera. Let's grab some data from the U.S. Naval Observatory website for first contact and fourth contact, along with the altitude and azimuth for, of the moment of the eclipse. And then we're going to graph them. Now, it may be hard to see because these circles are so small, but this is not a perfect representation since both altitude and azimuth are measured on, the, on a hemisphere dome, but it does accurately map both the size and the relative locations of the sun and the moon, giving us a picture for why the moon came in and left at an unexpected angle. So I feel this was an honest mistake, starting with the belief that the Earth is flat and then trying to fit real-world observations into that model, while neglecting some very key details such as exact trajectories and scale. So one way we know the heliocentric model is correct is that it can be used to predict things like eclipses accurately years in advance. Here's a still from an animation made by Larry Cohn in which he uh, uploaded to Vimeo fully 18 months before the 2017 eclipse. And over at Shadow and Substance, he created animations for every state in the United States that would expect an eclipse, showing visualizations for what the actual eclipse would look like on the ground. I'll show the one for Pennsylvania, and we'll play it twice. The first time through, watch Erie, Pennsylvania, and see if Larry's visualization matches what Jeremy actually witnessed. The second time through, watch the entirety of North America, and notice how dramatically different the view on the ground would be in a frequently counterintuitive way. So let's play the video, and... Not much is going to happen in Erie, Pennsylvania. So just keep your eyes on Erie. The eclipse is going to start about now. So Jeremy was up in Erie, PA, in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania. And so now we're approaching the eclipse totality. And so please notice that the, the obstruction came in from the lower right and then it's leaving sort of at, a, at the 1130 position. Now, uh, gast, uh, cast your gaze to the right side of the animation and just take a look at all of North America. And notice these patterns of shadows. They move in a very strange manner. Um, it's very, very counterintuitive. When I first started studying this, they, these, these didn't seem to make any sense at all. 
And the reason is that we're standing on a sloping surface and we're looking towards the sun in the sky, the sun and moon in the sky. So those directions of our gaze may be different for different observers. So again, this prediction, this animation was a prediction made fully three years before the event. So to recap, let's take one moment in time, 2.40 p.m. Eastern time from Erie, Pennsylvania, otherwise known as 1440 military time. Here we have a graphic based on the U.S. Naval Observatory data. Here we have a visualization by timeanddate.com and a prediction animation by Larry Cohn. And they're all in agreement, and they're all based on the heliocentric globe model. And they all match the reality photographed by Jeremy McGarry. Please let that sink in. When predictions match reality, such as the moment in time on the globe animated three years ahead of time, then it's a good indication that the prediction is based on an accurate model. I have never seen any flat earth model that can make any sort of sense of eclipses. Personally, I wanted to get into the eclipse predicting game with this video from about four months before the eclipse, in which I predicted, often with less than 1% error, 13 numerical aspects of the April 8th, 2024 eclipse. I suspect that my errors came from the fact that I assumed the Earth to be a perfect sphere instead of an oblate spheroid. The challenge was conceptually simple. Given the data from the nautical almanac shown here and intimate knowledge of the sun, moon, and earth, such as their sizes and distances, could you predict 12, actually 13, numerical aspects of the April 8th eclipse using only high school geometry? The challenge was open to both flat earth folks and globe folks, but I only got responses and accurate ones from globers. This is quite strange if the Earth is indeed flat. So, returning to Jeremy McGarry's presentation, that's not the moon? No, that's the moon. Special thanks to my faithful channel supporters, Dora, Johnny, and Luke. Rest in peace, Jim. And as always, your comments are welcome, but please be kind to each other. Bye.